The topic of this exhortation <clears throat> came to me one evening after we had put the kids to bed and the house was an absolute mess. And after a hard day of working with difficult clients, I was frustrated and irritated as I started cleaning and clearing up. But as I went into each room, I realized that this mess comes with having kids and that the kids are in fact a blessing. And I realized that I was getting worked up about the small things instead of being thankful for everything that I've been given. <clears throat> and I believe this is a feeling that we all experience at one time or another. Sometimes it feels as if life is a burden and that each task is, is another hurdle to get over. Some months we're just thankful to have gotten through the month. Rather than having days that feel as if they're filled with magic and wonder, it's possible to live each day on an unending list of tasks, washing the dishes, making the bed, making food, and so on. <clears throat> when we think about life, though, we should quickly realize that each day is a miracle, a blessing that thousands of people don't have. In South Africa, one person dies every minute, 74 people die each hour, 1,786 people die each day. Across the world, it's 150,000 people that die each day, or about 60 million people in a year. So in the span of a year, the, the number of people that die is equal to the entire population of South Africa. So the fact that you woke up this morning is a blessing. And we need to constantly praise God for this. As David exclaimed in Psalm 92, the first two verses, it is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. O declare your loving kindness in the morning, your faithfulness every night. On this side of the kingdom, brothers and sisters, we are forced to live very normal lives. Where in our day-to-day -day business, it often doesn't feel like we are a chosen nation, a royal priesthood. When we have to go home to do the dishes or do the ordinary repetitive chores of life, it's easy to forget our calling. Yet perhaps it's just as well as it keeps us humble in our service and we are indeed called to serve one another and to assist those in need. It's very easy to get bogged down in our minds by the everyday stresses of life. We find the story given to us of Mary and Martha, which we, we just read at the end of our chapter this morning. And in Luke 10, verse 38, Martha welcomes Jesus into her house, and the Greek word implies that she was being hospitable as a true disciple. But Mary, her sister, sat at Jesus' feet listening to him, whereas Martha, we read, was cumbered about with much serving. So she was distracted, probably preparing a dinner. So she gets herself worked up in her mind. She sees her sister sitting down at Jesus' feet, listening to him, but she feels that she's been left to do all the work. Eventually, she, she's so irritated that she goes to Jesus and says, don't you care that, your sister has, that my sister has left me to serve alone? And so she asks Jesus to get Mary to help her. But Jesus' reply to her, and to us, if we tend to do the same, is, you are worried and troubled about many things. The small things of life that tend to get us down. The everyday chores that need to get done. Jesus says one thing is needed, and that Mary has chosen it, which is listening to God's word. Jesus is spiritually pouring the oil of the word into Mary. She is being fulfilled up with the oil of the word of God. Jesus further adds that this will not be taken from her. So Mary chose something that will give her everlasting benefits and which would add or, or bring her closer to everlasting life. Whereas Martha was choosing to do something with temporary benefits. Now in Jewish culture, it was the men's role to focus on spiritual matters. Women were meant to focus on domestic things. Yet in this incident, 
Jesus commends Mary for leaving the domestic duties alone so that she can hear God's word. Mary sat at Jesus' feet like the disciple of a rabbi, and yet women in those days could not be disciples of rabbis. And we know that Jesus was called a rabbi. So this was a radical move that Jesus was, was making and a point that he was impressing, that both men and women could be his disciples. The parable of the sower can be uh, interpreted as being fulfilled every time we have the word sown in us. So some seed is choked with the cares of this life. And those are the exact same words that are used of Martha being distracted with her domestic duties so that she didn't hear Jesus' word. Are our attitudes stony, receptive, cumbered when we hear God's word? The apostles also asked Jesus at another time, do you not care? And this was when they were in a boat in a storm. But Jesus' whole life and death was because he did care. It's like a child's misunderstanding and lack of appreciation at a parent's love and self-sacrifice. And there's another incident in Luke 18, 22, where Jesus tells a young man to go and sell everything he has and distribute it to the poor, and that he would then have treasure in heaven. But the young man goes away sorrowful because he's very rich. Mary, in the incident we read, gives her life to Jesus in practice. The rich young man lacked one thing because he wasn't willing to give away his wealth for the Lord. <clears throat> we can hear and not do anything about what we've read. We can read our Bibles without making the message practical in our lives. We can be like the rich young man and put material possessions ahead of things of the truth. So when, when, when I was young and in my youth group um, and I was going for pre-baptism classes, the brother that took me for those classes spoke to me about work and making money. And he was retired at the time. And what he said to me was easy for me to hear at the time because I was still in school and I wasn't working. But as a working person, I now realize it's very difficult to apply. It's a difficult saying, as many of Jesus' sayings are, but it's plain and simple. The brother said to me, if you're asked to work on a Sunday morning or Wednesday evening for Bible class, just say no. Don't take a job where you'll need to work on a Sunday morning or Wednesday evening. Have faith. God will provide if you put him first. And throughout the scriptures, Jesus teaches us not to be anxious, but instead to focus on the kingdom. The focus upon only one thing in life gives us the ability to handle life's stresses and the challenges that life throws at us. Without that focus, life seems to be filled with so many things that can stress us and can distract us from the one thing that we know is truly needed. So let's apply that practically. And let's say that we've got a lot of work to do and to catch up on. So, um, so we feel like we don't have time to attend the Bible class. And Jesus's words to us here surely mean that we should abandon that work and rather attend the Bible class which can bring us closer to the scriptures and everlasting life. Whatever work we must do can't be compared to the hope of eternal life. It's about prioritizing and putting first things first. There's a matrix called the Eisenhower matrix, which has been used to classify tasks as either urgent and important, not urgent but important, important but not urgent, and not urgent nor important. So we may be inclined to classify things of the truth as important, but not urgent, which means that we might put these things in our calendars and schedule them. But if other tasks come up, such as work deadlines, things of the truth get pushed aside. 
but things of the truth are indeed urgent. It's easy to get caught up in this trap and uh, we can end up doing things that we deem urgent, but are not important. Just like Martha, she was serving something she thought was urgent, but it was actually not important at the time. And there is indeed a time for everything. There's a time to serve, there's a time to stop serving and rather to listen. <clears throat> the wise person will realize the truth in Ecclesiastes 3.17, which says that there's an appropriate time for every activity. The first eight verses of Ecclesiastes 3 reads, for everything there's an appointed time and an appropriate time for every activity on earth. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot what was planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give something up as lost. A time to keep, a time to throw away, a time to rip and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. So there's a right time to do something and a right way to go about doing it. Ecclesiastes 8 verses 5 and 6 reads, a wise person knows the proper time and procedure. For there's a proper time and procedure for every matter. One of the marks of the apostles of Jesus was how they were willing to leave their existing lives and work and follow Jesus without any hesitation. In Matthew 4, 18 to 22, it reads, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew's brother, casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. So they were busy casting their nets, about to fish. Then he says to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Then immediately, so we have that word immediately, they left their nets and followed him. And then going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee and Johnny's brother in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them and immediately we read, that they left their, net, their boat and their father and followed him. It's amazing how these fishermen just abandoned their nets, their tools of the trade that earned them a living, and, and they followed Jesus. It wasn't a convenient moment to be called for these apostles. They were in the act of casting their nets into the sea. And James and John, we read that they not only leave their boat, but they leave their father as well and follow Jesus. They were in the, the very act of mending their nets, and so they were intent on continuing to fish, but they leave everything and follow Jesus. In Mark 2.14, we read about Matthew, where it says, Jesus saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax office, and he said to him, follow me. And we know from other verses that Levi's other name was Matthew. So Matthew arose and followed Jesus. He abandons his tax station and follows Jesus. So these apostles knew what to prioritize. Matthew was at work when he was called. If we were in their situation, would we have abandoned our jobs, our work, our equipment, our families to follow Jesus? Would we have the faith to believe that Jesus could supply all our needs from that moment on? And do we have that faith now? Our world is full of distractions, where people medicate themselves with social media and videos of dancing cats. The art of meditation has taken off in our world because people need a, a way to quiet the mind, to learn how to discipline the mind and to bring stillness back to it. We, brethren, need to be able to discipline our minds and focus on what's important. Where is your focus now? Are you able to focus 
on the topic this morning? Or is your mind drifting somewhere else? Rather than being distracted, we need to be like the wise virgins in the parable that Jesus told. There are 10 virgins in the parable, and we know that 10 men were required for a synagogue to be formed. So this parable is most likely about the ecclesia, because they're virgins, those who have been baptized. All the virgins have lamps, and they all started all out with oil. As they all went out, so they all had access to the scriptures and an initial enthusiasm. But five of them did not take extra oil with them. The oil represents God's word and its application. The five foolish ones weren't filled with God's word and didn't apply it right up to the end. Whereas the wise took extra oil, expecting Jesus' return to be delayed. So we need to be very careful of being dogmatic about the timing and interpretation of prophecy, because these verses are a real warning to us not to stumble if things do not pan out the way we expect it will. And then the cry comes at midnight, the darkest hour of the night when everyone is asleep. And it's a bit sad, but it tells us that the whole ecclesia in the last day was sleeping. It was weak and not watching as it should have been. The obvious implication is that the call when Jesus returns takes everyone by surprise. The lamps of the foolish were going out, but the wise had enough oil. Apparently, lamps like those in the parable had to be replenished every 15 minutes. The wise virgins can therefore be pictured as sleeping for five or 10 minutes and then getting a jolt back into consciousness, refilling their lamps, while the foolish ones just continue to sleep. We know that the foolish ones still had a little oil in their lamps because the parable says that their lamps are, are going out. And then they plead with the, the wise virgins to give them some oil. But the wise ones say that there won't then be enough oil for them. And this alludes to God's grace. We are unworthy can, and can only enter the kingdom through grace. Those who were ready were waiting for Jesus, the bridegroom, when he came but those who were not ready were shut out. And this reminds us of Noah's Ark and the door being shut, where the foolish people didn't believe and were shut out of the, the ark when the rain started. Those who don't listen to God's word now and don't make a move to be baptized will be just like those. In Luke, we read that they'll be knocking on the door. Knocking is used as a figure of prayer elsewhere in the scriptures. So the foolish virgins pray, but it's too late. Jesus said he didn't know them, and that's because they didn't take the opportunity to be filled up with God's word and apply it. When Jesus returns, it's too late. And so our time to prepare is now. To ensure that we don't fall into a slumber like the unwise virgins, we need to be intentional about how we serve the Father, rather than just going through the motions each week. We need to analyze the scriptures and our own lives in order to recognize the dissonance that's there. And dissonance is the difference between what we know we should be doing and, and what we want to do, compared to how things are and what we are doing. Dissonance means a lack of harmony, and it's the initiator of change in our lives. It's what makes us unhappy with our current reality. The Bible, in many places, talks about meditating upon the scriptures. God told Joshua to meditate upon the Lord day and night. The word for meditate also means mutter, speak, talk, study, or utter. And it's different to another Hebrew word which means to muse upon. When David in the Psalms says that the man who is blessed meditates on, on God's word, he's using the first word to mutter, speak, study, talk, or utter God's word. And so, as we live our lives, we need to guard our minds. Our thoughts are largely what separates us from animals, the ability to reason, plan, guard the course of our lives. 
And so Philippians 4 verse 8 tells us to meditate on things that are true, noble, just, pure, of good reports, virtuous, and praiseworthy. The Greek means to think on those things. Similar thoughts are expressed in 1 Timothy 4.15, where, where we are told to meditate on being an example in word, conduct, love, faith, and purity. The word means to revolve the thoughts around in our minds. We also need to be actively thinking about how we can serve our brothers and sisters. And this is particularly important now as we enter the nomination process for next year's ecclesial serving positions. We need to give careful thought about the strengths of our brothers and sisters and nominate for them for a position that we think they will be good at to serve the ecclesia. We shouldn't just nominate someone because we feel sorry for them or think that they should do something. In order for the ecclesia to shine as bright a light as possible, brethren and sisters need to use their strengths to serve. And the same comes for the voting process. Instead of voting for the same brothers and sisters that we usually do, or voting for someone because we feel sorry for them, we should vote for brethren that can best do the job. In Gethsemane, Jesus asked his apostles to watch with him while he prayed. But when he came back to his apostles, he found them sleeping, just like the virgins who were slumbering in the parable. And so Jesus says, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so Jesus treats his apostles with grace. He allows for human weakness and says, sleep on now and take your, your rest. A reminder of the grace we need, and that will be shown to us at the judgment. Even the wise virgins were sleeping and slumbering when the bridegroom arrived. Then in Gethsemane, Judas comes with chief priests and elders, and Jesus gets arrested. He gets snatched away from the apostles in the, in the, the dark of the night. In Luke, Jesus says, this is your hour and the power of darkness. And we know in the future, Jesus will return in the dark hour, this time to snatch us away. And let us pray that we aren't spiritually sleeping when that happens. History often repeats itself. This incident actually happened with the entire nation of Israel. Moses once went, went up a mountain to pray to God, taking Joshua with him and leaving Israel behind. Like the apostles, the entire nation of Israel failed. And it's, it's, it's as if their eyes were closed to God's wonders and his word. They symbolically fell asleep and into a slumber when they started worshipping false gods and were met with a rebuke when Moses came down from the mountain. The similarities are too clear. The hidden parable in this incident clearly shows us that Jesus replaces Moses. And the warning for us is made very clear too. Now is the time to focus our minds, to ensure that no internal mental distractions steal our focus from the symbolism embedded in the bread and the wine. This is a time, or there is a time, for thinking about worldly activities, and there's a time to be thinking about spiritual things. Now is the time to order our minds and to think on the spiritual things. Our Lord's focus was continually on the kingdom. The parables he spoke centered on the kingdom. He was and is the only true, truly righteous priest and king. Jesus always had his priorities right. Sometimes Jesus' priorities shocked those around him, such as when he prioritized the children who wanted to come to him, saying that the kingdom belonged to people who had the faith of a child. When Jesus himself was a child at 12 years old, he prioritized his father's word in the temple as he listened to the teachers and ask them questions. Even his parents didn't understand his priorities then. Near the end of his time with his apostles, rather than trying to preach to as many people as possible or try and hide from his accusers, 
He arranges the Last Supper with the Apostles. He institutes the Feast of Remembrance, the memorial meeting, which we're at now. He sets the example for us of how we need to remember him and what, and, and, um, and we need to remember our Lord, no matter what state our lives are in, no matter what noise there is around us. Even on the cross, Jesus' concern is for his mother, his disciples, the criminal with him on the cross, and those who are crucifying him. The king may have been crucified, but the promises remain. Jesus said after having wine at the Last Supper, For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. The kingdom of God is coming, and we all look to that day when we will share wine with Jesus there. And to get there, we need to make sure that we put that kingdom and everything to do with the kingdom first in our lives and in our minds. Don't symbolically fall asleep or slumber. Stay awake and watch. In Jesus' own words, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen.